Good morning. Welcome to Grand Rapids First Nine Methodist Church. We are delighted that you have joined us for our in-person as well as our virtual worship today. In-person worshipers, uh, pay attention. We are going back to our blue hymnals. Remember these from a couple years ago? They've taken a nice reprieve, but we're bringing them back. So we'll be using um, our blue hymnals today. So I just want to remind you what they look like they are in your pews. The offering plates are at the front and back entrances of the sanctuary. We invite you to give um, your offering as you exit the sanctuary today after worship, or you can always do your um, worship, or you can do your giving online through our website, grfumc.org backslash give. Today after worship, you're invited to join Pastor Bob for a forum in the upper room. If you'd like to join us virtually, the Zoom loop the Zoom link will be available on our website. First Church scholarship um, applications are due tomorrow, so if you have not gotten your um, scholarship application in, they are due by tomorrow. This Saturday at 7.30, you are invited to join us for the Kelvin Alumni Choir Concert here in the sanctuary. We are celebrating Pastor Bob's retirement on May the 15th at the lunch after worship. Please RSVP for lunch by this Friday so our caterer as well as our fellowship committee knows how many people to plan for. You're invited to sign up for the Owls Lunch on May the 16th. Join our retirement age folks for lunch and to hear about ghost stories in Grand Rapids. Black Voters Matter is a national organization focusing on both voter registration as well as the, the empowerment of historically marginalized populations through voter access. The Voting Rights Task Force is pleased that the State Director of Black Voters Matter, Stephanie Williams, will join us after worship on May the 22nd to discuss both the way, the way, the ways efforts to restrict voting access have impacted communities of color and the work of Black Voters Matter. Please join us for that time on May the 22nd after worship. I invite you to save the date. Our annual church camping weekend is scheduled for August 12th through the 14th. More details will be coming soon. Today's ministry focus is celebrating our class of 2022 graduates. As, um, as we begin this time of celebration, I invite our high school graduates that are with us in worship today to come forward. Do I have any graduates with us? I know it's Sunday morning early, so. <laughs> All right. Our graduates this year are Rita Diarabasuba, Rhea Margus Marisigan, I see Rhea coming, Mariella Rampersad, CJ Sisko, Raylan Taylor, and Cameron Waisman. Come on up. Come on up. Steps aren't that intimidating. Ray and Cameron, you've survived a pandemic shutdown. You've survived a polar vortex, but you are not just survivors, you are certainly thrivers. You are making the world a better place. Your kindness, your compassion, your willingness to work through art, through music, through your academic accomplishments are very real and relevant. And we thank you for the gifts that you share with us and with our community. As this chapter of your life comes to a close and you go on to bigger and better things, we are thankful that you've been part of our church family and we pray that we've impacted your journey in some way. But wherever your journey brings you next, know that we are always here for you. Let us uh, join our hands together in celebrating their accomplishments. Let us pray for the graduates that we see as well. Oh, I forgot, I'm looking out and I see Darcy Walker. So Darcy, will you stand? Darcy graduated yesterday with her master's in social work. A little plug, um, a year ago, Darcy was here graduating from Grand Valley State University. Now this year, a year later, 12 months later, she did the accelerated MSW program at, at Grand Valley and she's here, so. Whew. Let us pray for our graduates. Gracious God, 
We thank you for the many ways in which you have walked with these individuals. You have been with them on stressful nights through studying. You've been with them as they have celebrated and shed tears over accomplishments as well as some setbacks. But in each and every step and turn, you have helped them to create and find their voice, which is a strong representation of the work that you have gifted them with. In this present moment, we're thankful for their accomplishments, but also look forward with them to a future that is coming into being. Be with them wherever they may go, that they may feel your presence, as well as this community's presence that goes with them. Amen. Congratulations. I'm here this morning to uh, bring your attention to two amazing concerts that we have coming up, both on uh, Saturday evenings. The next two Saturday evenings, May 7th at 7.30, uh, we have the Calvin Alumni Choir in concert here. Uh, and then the next weekend, May 14th, we have a brand new ensemble, a professional choral ensemble in Grand Rapids called Vox GR. And we have a quartet of singers from that ensemble this morning with us. Vox GR has gathered uh, an amazing array of singers and conductors among their midst, and they're presenting this concert called Thankful Remembrance. And that's coming May 14th at 7.30. Your, your bulletin says 7, but that's incorrect. It's 7.30. Both concerts uh, are at 7.30. Uh, this morning, we have uh, five individuals who have taken time out of their very busy schedules to, to give you a little teaser for this concert and to participate in our worship this morning. Uh, this morning, Cody Wallace is directing, and we have singers Jack Phillipson, Rachel Zaitis, Eric Reyes, and Jenny Reyes. So thank you very much for having them this morning. Mm -hmm. As we begin this time of worship, may our prayers be with the, these individuals and their families. For Peggy, for Myra, for Alana, for Betsy, for Jer, for Joe, for Rick, for Carl, for Barb, for Randy, for Bob, for Connie, for Amarina, for the, pa for the family of Patrick Laola and the Grand Rapids community, for Chuck. The love and prayers of our congregation are extended to Sandy at the death of her sister and the love and prayers of our congregation are extended to the Diara Suba family on the recent death of an uncle in the Ivory Coast. Please join us for, and the family of Maxine Snyder, whose memorial service will be held here at First Church on May the 6th, with the service at 2 p.m. The family will greet people one hour prior to the service. As we are here, let us be present, not only to what is going on around us, but let us be present to what is going on within us as the Spirit moves and guides us in our time together.
invite you to join me in the call to worship that is found in your bulletin. Peace be with you. This morning we gather in the name of the living Christ to worship God. Surely God is in this place and calls us to worship in spirit and in truth. Come and experience the love of God. Come and experience the peace of God that passes understanding. The living Christ is with us. Praise the Lord. Alleluia. Join our hearts together in the opening prayer. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Lord of dawn and darkness, how grateful we are for your loving kindness. You saw our fear and doubt, our suspicion, our mistrust, and you offered instead hope, peace, love, and joy. You called us to be your witnesses in the world. You invited us to be mirrors of your light and ambassadors of your love and justice, compassion and peace. Be with us in this time of worship as we participate in ministries of healing and hope. Give us the courage and strength to be your disciples in all the circumstances and complexities of life. For we ask this in the name of the risen Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. You may be seated.
The opening scripture lesson today comes from Psalm 30, beginning at verse 4. Sing praises to the Lord, O you faithful ones, have given thanks to God's name. For God's anger is but for a moment, and favor for a lifetime. Weeping may linger for the night, but joy comes with the morning. As for me, I said in my prosperity, I shall never be moved. But your favor, O Lord, by your favor, O Lord, you have established me as your strong mountain. You hid your face, and I was dismayed. To you, O Lord, I cried, and to the Lord I made supplication. What profit is there in my death if I go down to the pit? Will the dust praise you? Will it tell of your faithfulness? Hear, O Lord, and be gracious to me. O Lord, be my helper. You have turned my mourning into dancing. You have taken off my sackcloth and clothed me with joy, so that my soul may praise you and not be silent. O Lord, my God, I will give you thanks forever. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now the children may come forward for the children's moment. all here today. Hey friends, come on down. Friends, I want to, hey Simon, I want to give you a little starter to our children and worship story. Okay, Maura wants a snack, but that's irrelevant. We're going to just... We're going to just keep going, all right? Friends, oh goodness, friends, once there was someone so wonderful who said such amazing things that people from all over just had to ask him, who are you? And he said, I am the good shepherd. I know each one of my sheep by name. And I show them the way to the good green grass and the cool, clear water. And when we come to places of danger, I show them the way to safety. Hmm. I wonder who such a wonderful person could be. We'll find out, maybe when we go upstairs. Will you say a prayer with me today? Yeah, let's say a prayer. All right. God, thank you for our good shepherd, for showing us the way. In your name we pray, amen. Okay, friends. So today, we'll talk about amen when we go to children and worship today. I have a lot of information about that. Today, you may come on up to children in worship if you'd like to, and then parents, you can pick your kiddos up after worship, or if you're staying for our last day of after worship Sunday school, you can pick us, pick kids up after the forum. All right.
Good morning. I invite you, if you are able, to stand in honor of the reading of the Gospel. I am reading from the very last chapter of the book of Luke, and you will notice that the way this particular reading starts, it's connected to what you will not hear. But I invite you to go back and read the entire chapter, which I will explain more of as we go. Then the two from Emmaus told their story of how Jesus had appeared to them as they were walking along the road and how they had recognized him as he was breaking the bread. And just as they were telling about all that had happened, Jesus was suddenly standing there among them. Peace be with you, Jesus said. But the whole group was startled and frightened, thinking they were seeing a ghost. Why are you frightened, Jesus asked. Why are your hearts filled with doubt? Look at my hands, look at my feet. You can see that it's really me. Touch me and make sure that I am not a ghost, because ghosts do not have bodies as you see that I do. And as he spoke, he showed them his hands and his feet. Yet still, notice the wording, yet still, the disciples stood there in disbelief, filled with joy and wonder. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Will you pray with me? Gracious God, we ask that in these moments you will open our ears that we might hear, open our eyes that we might see. Open our minds that we might grow to understand more completely who you are and what you are calling us to be and to do. This we pray in the name of Christ. Amen. Did you notice? Did you notice the incredible specificity that Luke provided his readers about a classic in-between time. Did you notice that Jesus purposefully encountered the disciples in a way that reassured them that all was not lost and that he was alive after his death and resurrection? Now let's be patient, shall we? Let's not rush too quickly to the upper room just yet. Because we need to paint the picture of perspective. You can read the story from Luke 24 in its entirety just as easily as I, and I encourage you to do so. But this morning, for these few moments, I invite you to consider the story about the road to a maze. And what I ask you to do is to engage your imagination fully. I want you to notice, be curious, be prepared for the reality that there will be more questions than you will ever be able to answer. If there ever was a liminal season in the New Testament, the days after the resurrection was that time. The hopes and dreams of the disciples 
had crashed on the rocks of what might have been. They didn't know what to do with all of their memories. They didn't know what to do with their current reality or what they were going to do in their future. Most assuredly, the followers of Jesus were grief-stricken. They had stood along with the crowd at Golgotha watching the crucifixion. They had experienced the Last Supper, the prayer time in the garden. They had watched and saw up close and personal how the soldiers came and arrested Jesus on false pretenses. They watched in disbelief a carefully orchestrated trial, the physical abuse of their friend, followed by a horrific death. Even though even though the women who were the first witnesses of the resurrection and told their story convincingly, the 11 disciples were unconvinced. Their collective grief had left them consumed with wonder and doubt, but hope was in short supply. The friends of Jesus were no doubt sitting shiva, remembering, sharing their stories with one another, grieving, much like we do after the death of a loved one. But eventually, the followers of Jesus began to scatter. Many of them returned to their homes and to the life that they had lived prior to Jesus. According to Luke, two disciples had left Jerusalem to return to their home in Emmaus after the crucifixion. While we don't know specifically where Emmaus was, biblical archaeologists believe that Emmaus was a small village just seven miles northwest of Jerusalem, a good day's walk. Scholars and preachers have speculated for centuries about the oddity that Jesus actually came and joined them in their walk. He conversed with them, and yet somehow those two did not recognize Jesus. As the story goes, the two finally realized it was Jesus when at supper Jesus blessed the bread and he broke it, which suddenly helped them to remember. And they were awakened. Luke wrote that the two disciples gathered their things quickly and returned to Jerusalem that night, immediately, to go share what had happened. And they were, and as they were telling their story to their colleagues, Jesus visited that larger group of disciples and followers, and he said, peace, peace be with you. Practically speaking, Jesus was making his third appearance. You remember, he appeared to the women on Easter morning. He appeared to the two on the road to Emmaus, and now to even a larger group in the upper room. But remember how Luke described it? He wrote that the group was startled and afraid, thinking they were seeing a ghost, which probably speaks more to their fear than to their faith. We understand that, don't we? Now don't overlook those direct questions, and they are important questions that Jesus asked his friends. Why? Why are you frightened? Why are you filled with doubt? Look at me. Touch 
me if you must. Do whatever it takes to alleviate your fears and your doubts. And still, Luke wrote, the disciples stood there in disbelief, filled, and I think this is curious, disbelief, but filled with joy and wonder. Now sit with that image just a moment, because it's a powerful one. It's much more like you and I than we've ever thought about before. Fear, doubt, and disbelief were just as dominant in that moment as was faith and joy and wonder. And thank God for Luke's realism. He didn't paint the picture without human emotion. He told us straight on that the disciples were reactive. They were fearful. They had doubts. They had a hard time believing, even though their evidence was growing. At the same time, Luke wrote that the disciples were guardedly optimistic, filled with joy, he said, yet still wondering, wondering, how can this be? Can Jesus really be alive? We saw what happened. How can this be? Now hold on to all of that image, will you? Just a moment as I take you back to a concept that we have explored frequently over the last 26 months. A liminal season is in between time. A liminal space is standing in a threshold, able to look back with 2020 hindsight, yet unable to have a clear vision into what's ahead. Living in the in-between time is frustrating for most of us, just like it was, I'm sure, for the disciples. A liminal season is a process of moving through our doubts and questions. Moving through the uncertainty and the chaos that's often accompanied by curiosity and creativity and innovation. As uncomfortable as it may be, people tend to open their minds with possibilities when everything is uncertain which is where imagination begins to live. The retired president of Pixar and Walt Disney Animation Studios, Dr. Edwin Catmull, described liminality this way. He said, there is a sweet spot between the known and the unknown where originality happens. The key for any person who's in that space is to be able to linger there without panicking. Now, I love that phrase. Linger without panic. Father Richard Rohr, the Franciscan contemplative who's a prolific author, explained liminality this way. Liminal space is when we are in between, when we are betwixt and between, having left one stage of life but not yet entered the next. We usually enter liminal space when our former way of being is challenged or changed. It's a grace-filled time, even though it doesn't feel grace-filled. In liminality, we are not certain, nor are we in control, but we are open and vulnerable enough 
to allow something new to emerge. You see, friends, from Easter to Ascension and then even on to Pentecost, the disciples were in liminality. Just as we have lived through liminality these last 26 months. Oh, I know, I know, we are slowly working our way out of the pandemic, but the aftermath of it all is going to be with us for a very long time. The cost of human loss is staggering. With nearly one million deaths in the United States alone, and still, and still, after all this time, there is still one-third, one-third of our population that is still not vaccinated. <coughs> Through it all, we are learning lessons. We have learned that there is a disturbing lack of trust of not just governmental guidance, but health care guidance, which is even more disturbing. Much of the suffering and the death that we have tried to weather these months could have been very different if people would have cooperated with the guidance that's been given with incredible care and concern by medical professionals. Somehow, Somehow we have made this virus a political issue rather than a health issue, a science issue. And we've been wrong. We have learned that there is a lack of concern for safety and welfare of our neighbors and our loved ones and older adults and anyone who is vulnerable. We have learned that the voices and actions of the conservative Christian nationalist organizations is as much or more of a threat to the greater good than any ideology or power in our world. And it's sad. We have learned that our economic fragility is real that isolation and the lack of human social engagement is devastating. We have learned that poverty and hunger is at epidemic proportion, that mental health and suicide and violence is a major issue in every community and among every socioeconomic level. And we have learned that racism continues to be at the heart of nearly every social and religious challenge that we are facing today. These 26 months have been the invitation for thoughtful and mindful people to evaluate and re-evaluate their values. We've been re-examining how we spend our time and resources, what we are invest investing ourselves in. We are reassessing our work and whether our work really matters. <clears throat> People are waking up to the fact that healthy relationships matter more than anything that life is precious and that every second of every day is a gift that must be lived to its fullest. Now what I want to tell you briefly is that this, that same re-examination is happening in the people of faith. People are assessing and reassessing the role of faith and our participation in faith communities. People are giving voice to what they need 
what they're longing for, what they're searching for, what they've been missing or what they've taken for granted. That kind of personal clarification is dramatically affecting communities of faith. Every church is facing, ev facing it. Every temple is facing it. Every synagogue and every mosque. We cannot, we cannot escape the reality that this is an important time in the history of the world. In the not too distant future, we're going to look back at this liminal season and we're going to give thanks with gratitude if we use it wisely. Or we're going to look back at this season with great disappointment and regret because we didn't have the courage to make the best of our in-between time. Please, friends, please don't let fear or doubt or unbelief win the day. Instead, give yourselves to wonder, to joy, to prayer, so that faith, hope, and peace will emerge. A few months ago, Janu in January of this year, Thich Nhat Hanh, the Vietnamese Buddhist monk, famous teacher, author, and peace activist, died at the age of 95. He's considered one of the founding pioneers of mindfulness, which has swept the world spiritual culture. In one of the articles that I read about him, there was this following quote that I want to share with you. He said, Western civilization places so much emphasis on the idea of hope that we have sacrificed the present moment. Hope is for the future. Memory is for the past. But neither hope or memory will help us discover the joy and the peace and the enlightenment that is available to us in this present moment. The present moment, friends, is all we have. So celebrate. Do something with it. Use today wisely. Be efficient. Be effective with your use of your time and your talents and your treasures. The greater good is calling for it. We have this. So gracious God, as we have gathered to worship this day, we are mindful of your presence. As you spoke peace to your disciples, so we long to feel your peace. We ask that you do your recreative work within us and among us so that we may continue to know the risen Christ is leading and guiding us through this important in-between time so that all of our tomorrows will be even more meaningful than anything we have known in the past. This we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. <clears throat>
invite those from the Cuban mission team to come forward at this time. One week from today, four individuals from our church will be traveling to Cuba to be in ministry with our long-standing partners and friends at the Aradura United Methodist Church. Um, the Aradura Church is a very active congregation um, that reaches out in ministry to their communities with a feeding program and with a number of missions that extend for miles to reach underserved Cuban um, persons with faith community and with support and material um, goods and our church has been blessed to be able to be supportive of their ministry for many, many years. Um, as we uh, pray this morning, we send you with our love and our support and um, our thankfulness that we can get back to traveling again. This is our first. We usually go to Cuba uh, once a year from this church, and it's been two years since we've been able to go because of COVID. So this is exciting. So as we pray this morning, I invite all of us to reach out a hand of support and blessing. Let us pray. Gracious God, you have called us to be your people and to share your love and grace wherever we go, both near and far. We pray for your provision of guidance, safety, and peace for these individuals from our church family who will be traveling to Cuba. Give them strength to work with open hands, open minds, and open hearts as they share and receive your love in relationship with the congregation of the Eridura Church. And bless our Cuban siblings in Christ as they offer us their gifts of welcome and hospitality. Continue to draw all of us together as a church as we endeavor to carry out your mission of healing, justice, equity, and love for all people. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
able uh, to join us for the forum, I would invite you to do so. We are going to uh, present really for the first time the um, sketches of possible building uh, renovation uh, to make the building more fully handicap accessible. So we invite you to join us if you can. Brian Wren is a wonderful hymn writer. That's the hymn writer of the hymn we just sang. And I want to draw just one phrase because it summarizes what we've been saying today as much or more than any other. He wrote, Jesus comes to claim the here and now and dwell in every place Christ is not just a memory. It's not just looking back to see what happened back then. It's a discovery process of what each of us go through every single day. Christ is alive. And we can take courage from that. We can have strength and comfort and peace. So go forth from this place, renewed in your own spirit, eager and ready to serve God in all you do, in all you say, and in all you do.